Greetings, interactive literature fans. I think it is time to return to the children of the night. So let's talk about Vampire the Masquerade Parliament of Knives by Jeffrey Dean. There is blood beneath your fingernails. Remnants of a nightly ritual that has somehow become routine. Your hunger stirs deep within, lured by the scent. But you cast it from your mind. There are more important matters afoot. The full moon casts its ruddy blessing on the blood hunt, spiriting your band of assassins through the long cast shadows along the irregular peaks and valleys of an unattended construction site. You lance through the night, a deadly arrow seeking the heart of a vampire you've heard much of but never knew. Robert Ward, defected from the high society of Ottawa's Camarilla elite to endure in the filth among the clanless and anarchs. Long years of leisure befitting your rank have left your survival skills blunted, but the thrill of the hunt has brought old instincts, once thought forgotten, back to the surface, seething with untapped potential. You know this to be true. You can feel it in your bones. But one siren's song calls above all others, driving you to distraction. There is blood beneath your fingernails. Remember when I was a newbie to the franchise when I started up on a review of the first one of these? Yeah, I've gotten significantly more familiar with VTM in the meantime. To me, Night Road was an excellent jumping off point to learning about all the insane crap that happens in this intellectual property. Now, Night Road was more focused on the survival aspects of being a vampire in this world. Parliament of Knives puts more emphasis on the aspect that is more frequently expected of this franchise. The backstabbing, infighting, and hyperambition among the different groups. It's almost amazing how little these guys get along considering the secret society they build and maintain. The Camarilla works in a somewhat feudal system. Every city has a prince, and that prince answers to no one except the higher-ups in the Ivory Tower. The prince's word is law but they still need to work through intermediaries in order to get things done, so they delegate power to different officers and a council of primogen. And in this book, you will be placed right smack dab in the middle of all that. So, what's the setting of this one? Well, it looks like for this book, you and I are going to be going to Canada. This book takes place in Ottawa, the capital of Canada. And I will say, I do appreciate how these books take us to different places, not just locking us in, say, L.A. or New York. That settles it, then he says decisively. No retreat. We're doing this, Gordon. He grabs your full attention. Nests of Anarchs infiltrating our prince's domain without his knowledge or blessing are a cancer that the Camarilla has seen again and again. And it's only gotten worse since so many in the Bruja and Gangrel clans defected to join them. If we leave them here to fester, they're a masquerade breach waiting to happen. The masquerade. The one set of rules almost all civilized kindred can agree upon. Mortals can never be allowed to learn about the supernatural reality that encircles them. Nothing is more important to a vampire in modern nights. Of course, such widespread deception is impossible to maintain constantly, and the occasional breach has led to the rise of professional vampire hunters and secretive government agencies allied into the Second Inquisition, the greatest threat to your kind in centuries. So what's the story of this one? Well, this book is mired in secrets, mystery, alliances, and lots of murder. Following the disappearance of Ottawa's prince, Arundel, there is an incursion of anti-Camarilla vampires called Anarchs. These guys pose a threat to your group, but not so great a threat that your friends won't squabble over their own affairs. The disappearance of Arundel has led to a seneschal, and your sire, Corliss, to take up command of Ottawa's Camarilla. She tasks you to search for Arundel, as well as eliminate the Anarchs if you can. However, you might have your own plans for the future of the city. Do you stay loyal to your sire, or oppose her? Which of the city's vampires do you ally with? Do you trust anyone? Gerard nods to himself and looks up from the notebook. It didn't take much asking around to find out more about Robert Ward for you. Surprisingly enough, it's not a lack of information that's the problem. It's the preponderance of it. Almost everyone I spoke to had a story or they've heard one. Usually it's like pulling teeth to find that information about Kindred. So the excursion was rather refreshing. That is, until I started to get conflicting reports. Conflicting, you ask? It's to be expected, I suppose. How much is conflicting? Gerard grimaces. Over a third of it. It seems our friend Ward left an impression wherever he went. Big personality. Not surprising, you say. You remember the man's face leering up at you as his hand tightened around your neck. Some meetings are hard to forget. This is a story of intrigue, which means that it's going to have an element of mystery and an element of dueling wits. 
It's hard to know who is for or against you, but it is obvious that everyone is out for themselves. And once again, just like in Night Road, we have a glossary of terms and characters for you to look through if you don't understand a term or want to look at the beautiful pictures of these gorgeous, gorgeous people. It's also worth noting that the bios of the various characters does actually have some information about them that isn't brought up in the book itself. So you can always trot through those in order to get a better understanding of the characters. And it might help you with a puzzle later. Now let's look at these characters we will be working with or against. But who are you? Well, you are a vampire who, due to the fact that you are connected with Ottawa's Seneschal, you have access to the powerful members of the city's council. You became a vampire a fair amount of time ago, though exactly where or when is pretty vague. One neat thing is that, in addition to choosing your clan and gender, you can usually choose what your character's apparent age is. I say apparent age because vampires stop aging once they turn. But I have guessed that your character has been around for a little less than a century. So still a bit young by vampire standards. But you've also had a chance to develop your survival skills. Principal among the cast, we have Corliss, your sire. You work for her, as befits a child. And she will always look like this, regardless of the clan you are in. If you choose Nosferatu, she will be using a glamour to cover up her deformities. Her looking like this does make me think that this book was made with the idea that the main character was a Ventru. Many kindred of Ottawa don't think she is good for the role of power, and oppose her. Next, we have Sheriff Key, a Nosferatu who- Wait, wait, wait. That's a Nosferatu? That has got to be the prettiest Nosferatu ever. If the very first vampire you get a portrait of wasn't the Nosferatu Bouchard, I'd suspect the author or illustrator didn't understand the Nosferatu. Now, to be fair, you can get around the Nosferatu curse, but it's generally too much effort to be worth it. I get the impression that Key is of a weaker generation than the other members of the cast, but makes up for it with control over much of the Ottawa police and exceptional combat skill. Next is Kashif, Ottawa's only member of Clan Banu Hakim. For a long time, the Banu Hakim clan was not allowed in the Camarilla land after the clan joined the Anarch Rebellion. Recently, though, the clan has rejoined the Ivory Tower, but the wounds still run deep. While Prince Arundel allowed the clan back into the city, the vampires of Clan Tremere were not as welcoming. Kashif entered and the Tremere largely left, leaving behind only a few of the blood sorcerers. Kashif himself doesn't feel it's safe to bring more of the clan in due to the animosity it has stirred from the Tremere, and he is certain they are planning to eliminate him. So he searches for allies where he can, either among the Malkavians or other groups. Next is Prince Annabelle, Tremere leader of the Kindred of Quebec City. The fact that a prince of another city is interested in the goings-on in Ottawa probably doesn't bode very well. She sent a servant named Trevor Height to Ottawa to discuss terms involving what the Tremere want in return for returning to the city. Last, and certainly not least, is Robert Ward. He is of the Clan Bruja, one of the primary clans of the Anarch Rebellion and known for how physically dangerous they are. Hugely strong, blindingly fast, and immensely hard to kill. Ward fits this group to a T. He leads a group of local Anarchs along with his own helpers. Now, he might look like a muscle-bound meathead, but he's actually pretty darn clever. While he is terrifying in a close quarters fight, Ward is very good at organizing the guerrilla forces of the Anarchs to combat the Camarilla. But even opposed to the Ivory Tower, he's still very much a factor in his politics, as apparently he, Arundel, and Corliss seem to have a history. In addition, he seems to have a particular interest in you, the protagonist, for reasons that I will wait until the spoiler section to talk about. Before I do that, though, a few thoughts on the story as a whole. Like with Heroes of Myth, secrets and lies are important here, as any self-respecting vampire has a few aces up their sleeve. You won't even be privy to all the secrets at a time. Even after playing this upwards of five times, I feel like there are still secrets present that I can't find. Heck, even the most important piece of information in the whole book, a bit that changes pretty much everything, might not actually get presented to you if you choose a certain direction. I say this because I didn't learn this vital bit of information on my first playthrough, and it resulted in a vastly different outcome for my character from what my later runs would present. This is true in smaller scales too. There is a lot going on in the city, and you can't be present for all of it. But my biggest criticism of the story is that it kind of starts a bit slow. You don't get too much freedom until a couple of chapters in, nor do you get too many opportunities to be particularly vampire-like at first. These bits are setup heavy, the beginnings of an investigation, meeting all the important characters, and some minor bits of action and intrigue. The truly fun stuff takes a little while. 
But soon enough, you get your opportunities to start hunting people and fighting the vamps that you don't like. I mean, hell, if you play your cards right, you can even have the opportunity to blow away a vampire with a freaking machine gun. Bouchard doesn't bother wasting his strength to turn in your direction. But the command to FIRE is clear when it escapes his cracked and bleeding lips. The M2 Browning jerks in your hands and barks out an unbearable roar, thundering throughout the enclosed sewer lair as a steady stream of belt-fed 50 cal rounds tear through the space between you and Christine. The doomed warlock doesn't have a chance to blink, much less scream, as your body explodes into a hail of gore. Bones shatter into a thousand shards, each ricocheting outwards, tearing skin and undead organs to pieces. A second later, the belt jams and the gun goes silent, but the foul function is far too late for your victim to benefit from. Just saying, any book that lets you do that has to be at least worth your time. So you do get to have your fun, especially in the tail end of the book. But now it's time for spoilers. So I will leave this time code here and give you ample time to move forward to the mechanic section. Ready? Okay. Corliss isn't your sire. She actually killed your sire. And Prince Arundel knows. If you ally with Ward and the Anarchs for a while, they will give you the opportunity to unlock some memories that Arundel suppressed. You learn that the day you were sired, Corliss and your actual sire got into a fight. She beat up your sire and then proceeded to diabolize her. A process where a vampire cannibalistically drinks all the blood from another vampire. Arundel came in afterwards and stopped Corliss from killing you. Instead, messing with your mind to convince you that Corliss sired you. Yeah, for a game that hinges on your relationship to Corliss, this is pretty significant. There is also, of course, who is responsible for Arundel's disappearance, but I think I'll preserve the mystery on that one for you guys. But there is one more character to talk about here. Another player who inserts herself into this mess. We have the Archon, Adeline Durand. She owns her introductory scene effortlessly terrifying the vampires around her. They're still out there, an unfamiliar voice says from a chair in front of Corliss's desk. Its occupant has her back to you, legs crossed. She's surprisingly short, given the deep, commanding nature of her voice. You'll have to dismiss them, Eden. She cranes her head backwards to look at you. And this is your youngest child? Come here, Gordon. I don't have all evening to wait for you to fidget. Corliss waves you forward and you follow her direction. The woman in the chair folds her black-gloved hands together as she looks you over, eyes narrowed, committing every detail to memory. Her arms are thick, and you can tell that they're corded with muscle, even through her formal attire. Despite her intimidating presence, she looks distinctly uncomfortable, though you have little doubt that she could spring into action in an instant, regardless of circumstance. Her gaze lingers for a moment along the side of your jacket, where you have your weapon concealed. You wish to see me? You ask Corliss. Not her. The seated woman says flatly, Me. I am Archon Adeline Durand, and it is my intention to finish any business in this frozen wasteland as soon as possible. Your sire informs me that you were recently attacked by the Anarch Robert Ward. Is that correct? Straight to business, then. This is clearly not a woman to be trifled with. If you're going to hide any information from her, you'd better be convincing. An Archon of the Camarilla is the personal problem solver and hitman for an Inner Circle member, and thus, holds more authority than a prince, and often a force to be reckoned with. Duran can be a powerful ally or a deadly enemy. All the vampires tiptoe very carefully around her. It's unknown the reasons for involving herself, or what specific problems she is trying to address. I could also talk about the different plots that are going on here, but I think this is a good point to stop. Let's go on to the mechanics section. And those of you who saw my Night Road video might see some similarities here. I think one of the unintended benefits of basing the games off of an existing tabletop role-playing game is that there is already a standard for how the mechanics work, with only a little bit of adjusted needed to bring it to a choose-your-own-adventure games. That might prove useful for future products. These stats return to the regular bars for the skills instead of the dots I liked, but everything seems fine. I will admit to confusion about the difference between Composure and Resolve stats, but this is also present in the other games. And otherwise, things seem fine. We have our relationship stats, which measure all sorts of different characters here, but you will notice that not all of them are represented. Now at the beginning of the game, you can choose your clan. You were given three options, Ventru, Toreador, or Nosferatu. Which clan you take does create narrative differences, as generally different vamps treat different clans differently. Considering this book is much more tied to vampire politics than Night Road, I don't begrudge the author to limit things to three clans. Like, if you were clan Banu Hakim, 
then many things would turn out differently. Bruja, Gangrel, and some Bano Hakim would have trouble doing anything in the Camarilla as they're associated with the Anarchs. Ravnos, Dimitzi, and Hakata are also not trusted. But the main part of choosing your clan is choosing the disciplines you have access to. Do you get to be strong? Want mind control? Do you want excellent eyesight? Well, obviously the best one here is Nosferatu, because that one has animalism, and you get a pet rat. You wake at nightfall, feeling hungrier, but focused and resolved. Your mind fresh and ready to face the challenges of the hunt. Your Sina skitters onto the vanity and cheers away at you. No more sun! Time for waking! Good morning, your Sina. You're awfully cheerful this evening. You're needing it, yes? Your Sina squeaks. Your dreams! They were... You sense her fumbling for the right way to convey a human concept. Sent to me. You are nervous. Your Sina wants to cheer you up. Wait, you stammer through the bond. You can see my dreams? Your Sina shakes her head and chitters. First time. Saw a hunt. Bad smelling warlock from the council. Mama Corliss and friend Jordan. What happens? Sire Corliss called a blood hunt for today, you say, running a thumb down your Sina's wiry coat of gray fur. You'd never imagined that the tiny creature could see into your dreams. You had trouble sleeping. Maybe you unconsciously called out through the bond for comfort as you tossed and turned. Kindred politics, you say. It's complicated. Your Sina sends an image that could be interpreted as a human sniffing in distaste. All you people's business complicated. Calm down. Stop fighting. Have something to eat. Don't say it, you say, quirking eyebrow. Say what? Your Sina replies. Oh, she wiggles excitedly. Jeez? You can use a discipline when the option is given to you, but it comes at a cost. You see, using disciplines costs blood, which increases hunger. Hunger also increases passively. Get too hungry and your character will be unable to control themselves, which will be a bit of a problem for a group wanting to stay secret. Also, maxing out your hunger locks you from using disciplines, so you only get so many uses in a scene. After that, you gotta feed. Now, the game gives you many opportunities to eat, some of them even free of charge, but there are also a bunch of cases where you can go hunting. These are always some of my favorite bits, as you need to be creative to get your food, and it's fun seeing the different ways you can ambush people. I know that sounds creepy, but you are a vampire. And the fun thing about these hunts is that they can have tiny stories in of themselves. Sometimes, you even meet interesting people. You can almost hear the gurgling fountain from all those years ago, but this time you stalk through a silent gloom, gliding towards the elderly gentleman, like an angel of death. He doesn't raise his head as you approach, but a twitching in his gnarled right hand betrays him. He knows you're here. Have you come to take me then? The old man asks suddenly. His ragged voice sounds tired and world-weary, like he's seen one too many winters. I've been coming here for almost a year since you took Samantha, waiting for you to come back and take me too. He tilts his head back and pulls a cloth cap from his bald head, clutching it to his chest. Have mercy on me, Spectre. Take me to my wife. You're caught off guard. Far from giving you the nostalgic hunt you craved, this mortal is greeting you as though he knows your business quite well. You once heard it said that those with one foot in the grave can sometimes sense undeath your lack of a beating heart and the reek of your damnation. But such tales are often impossible to verify. In theory, anyway. Will you say nothing? The old man says, peering up at you. I'm ready. I've made my peace. Just make it quick. Dude! I just wanted to eat you! I wasn't ready for feels! Yeah, some of these hunts are actually pretty darn interesting. I have to commend Mr. Dean for these. And, of course... What's a vampire story without being given the opportunity to be a badass? Your bestial opponent hesitates for a fraction of a second as you meet his charge, and that's more than enough time for you to slam an elbow into his jaw, dropping him to his knees with a feral scream and shattering a bone. Wasting no time, you draw your handgun, firing several shots in rapid succession. It's almost impossible to miss from this close, and your opponent drops, twitching. You jump back as his body falls to the floor, eyes already scanning the factory's entryway for enemies. Your mercenary allies and other kindred have already searched past while you and Key took care of the sentries, and the sound of gunfire booms off the crumbling red bricks. Choices seem to be back to just checking one stat instead of the two from Night Road, as a lot of the attributes and skills have been cut down to these nine. There are still plenty of skill checks out there for you, and I feel free to play around because, once again, training your skills is not tied to successful skill checks. Yes, aside from using skills in the first couple chapters, your skills will primarily increase when you're asleep and dreaming. The dreams even helpfully tell you which skills they are increasing for your convenience. 
In the early years after your embrace, you saw almost as much of Arundel as you did Corliss. He would later become more reclusive, allowing your sire to train you as she saw fit. But when you were still a fledgling, he shared a select few skills with you. You can see him now through the dream ether. His eyes are serious, but not cold. He wants you to succeed and survive. Corliss's physical training wasn't up to the prince's high standards. He sent me to train overseas with the masters in the art of combat. Plus strength, plus stamina, plus resolve. It's a little odd that it's retroactively increasing your skills, but it works. And I think that pretty much covers it. Explore Ottawa and its secrets. Find dark truths and upset the balance of power. You might be a pawn in the schemes of others, but you have your own plans in store for them. And that is Vampire the Masquerade Parliament of Knives, my second favorite in the choice of games VTN titles. I hope this has been helpful to you. Take care, friends. Let's begin. Right. All right. I get the impression that Key is of a weaker generation than the other vampires of the cast, but Jesus Christ, stop that. A vampire with a freaking machine gun. <laughs> I'm excited for this bit. The woman in the chair folds her black gloved hands together as you look as sh the woman in the chair folds her gla the woman in the chair folds her gla the woman in the chair holds ah, I keep messing up in different spots. <laughs> My crowning achievement, voicing a rat. <laughs> His ragged voice sounds tired and world-weary. Weary. Blah. <laughs>